This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. Awesome Chat is brought to you by Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash awesomecast. <laughs> Hey guys, Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter for your awesome chat, the show where we talk to people in and around and lately a lot outside of Pittsburgh uh, around technology and uh, cool things in geekery and gaming and very much gaming this week uh, as we're going to get into the physical games, the board games uh, with somebody that I met uh, uh, at the Gathering of the Juggalos here a couple weeks ago. But I'm really excited to tell you guys about what's going on with him. Uh, but in the meantime, please check out everything at awesomecast.com. You can check out all the past awesome chats. We've had a few of them over the years, as well as the uh, regular awesome cast itself, uh, which that, of course, is uh, live on Facebook Live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. You can join us in the chat and on the Facebook for that. And keep an eye out for whoever might be uh, joining us on the awesome chat at an odd time during the week as well uh, over on that Facebook page and please subscribe to the awesome chat the awesome cast and the Sorgatron Media Master Feed so you don't miss anything going on uh, with around our interviews and shows uh, and things like that wherever you like to check out podcasts or our video shows or anything so I, like I said I met I met the, uh, our guest this week from the Gathering of Juggalos I'm familiar with his work let's say, with the Morton's List and everything. So very excited to have one of the co-creators of that. Uh, and he's got a new game coming out called Drug Lord. He is with us from his secret underground bunker. Uh, <laughs> uh, That's right, yeah. We're, we're here We're here in an undisclosed location. Um, as you know, when working on games at the underground, it's important to not leave too big of a footstep. Um, and if there's one thing I've learned in my research for Drug Lord, Lord of Drugs, and my extensive viewing of Drugs, Inc. and various documentaries that when appearing on camera, talking about drugs, it's very important to always have your face covered so no one can tell your true identity. Absolutely. So that's very important here for the release of this board game. Absolutely. Is there, our Jesse Deneau uh, joining us here this week, and is there, an, is there an ice cream truck in the background by, by chance? That kind of relates to it, right? I can neither confirm nor deny uh, if there may or may not be an ice cream truck outside of this undisclosed location. Possibly this may be a low budget hotel uh, here on a remote outskirt of possibly Queens or the Bronx, um, where there may be ice cream trucks nearby, but we can't confirm or deny that. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, so of course, you know, you, I want to get into your history, of course, uh, uh, with game and game design. But tell us about the new project you have. Drug Lord, as of this recording, is currently on Kickstarter uh, uh, right now, in process. You guys can 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 donate to this, and we'll get to how you can do that as well. What is Drug Lord? That's right. That's right. This is my first Kickstarter game. I've been doing board games um, actually since Bizarre, of all things. It was an Insane Clown Posse album um, from the late 90s. I remember it. It's a classic. Um, and actually, that was my very first kind of widely produced board game. Mm. Um, from there, I went into Morton's List in 2001 um, on up into today. Quest for Shangla, various other uh, projects. But Drug Lord is kind of the culmination of everything that I've seen in my lifelong dedication to playing board games. I grew up um, and really had a transformative experience with Dungeon, which a lot of people may remember, um, kind of an entry-level game that gets you ready for what can happen if you start doing things with Dungeons & Dragons, uh, tabletop gaming, those kind of things. So from there, of course, I learned about Risk and Monopoly and the other classics. And so I really wanted to get a game that pulled in all of those kind of details, but with a modern kind of you know subject matter and flavor to it. Um, and in any true transaction style, we have our various wares, um, which we have laid out for you on display. As you can see, Drug Lord comes with a deluxe brief printed style, briefcase style printed box, 18 by 18 inch, four, uh, four corner style foldable board, 74 distinct regions. As you can see, there's a superficial resemblance to risk. Um, in that it is a global game of territory dominance to start. But unlike Risk, which is just board games, as you can see, each of the territories is part of this greater regions. Um, within Drug Lord, what you're really trying to do is match up areas that are high producing areas, um, say regions in Peru or Colombia, with high consuming areas, say places on the eastern seaboard 
or Western Europe or Australia, places that are very large markets. Um, within the various cards, then these, these region cards specifically, then basically the regions show you what part of the country or what part of the world you're ultimately on. Hmm. Um, depending on the region space, it's going to have a number of resources here at the bottom, which kind of show what it produces, and an area at the top that shows what it uses. By combining the different resources, you're trying to get the drugs from where they're made down here to where they're consumed up here. The tricky part also is that just like real life is the use of oceans is very important. So if you have ports, say here on Antakya, Colombia, you can basically ship anywhere along this whole Atlantic coast. If you have areas that are adjacent to each other by land, then you can actually truck them over. And you see over here at the edge of the board, there is a handy reference showing that land-based trades are the easiest, sea-based trades are a little bit harder, and air-based trades where actually flying the drugs are riskiest of all. So it's not just what territories you control, but the combination of territories and how those territories are going to make your trades easier. Because if your territories are botched and mess up, then they're actually stored via this mechanism of trap house cards, which are somewhere else. On the trap house cards, they actually store the various cases. And as you store these cases, that basically penalizes you. So a successful case, for example, or a successful trade is going to move you up one on this racetrack style mechanism here at the bottom. As, as you can see, there's a racetrack here. Um, and if you do not successfully trade, then that ends up in a, as a case. There's five spaces for cases, as you can see here. I don't know if it's overexposed. I'm also having a pop of this. On this message, or on this, pop, on this uh, card here, and then at five, you're ultimately penalized. Play goes until 20 points. So you're basically trying to complete transactions in a speed manner where you're trying to race against opposing players. Um, besides doing trades, of course, you can attack other regions. So similar to risk, you can basically have a warfare style model where you're getting one next to the next, next to the next. Am I dropping out again? No, you're good. I'm following along. Okay, very good. Excellent, excellent. All right. And besides doing this kind of risk style combat, where you can actually take over opposing territories or even uh, attack their resources directly to keep them from trading the resources. You can actually draw from additional resources. So beyond the resources that you produce down here, then you can actually draw extra resources that are available here as far as the re these resources that actually give you additional trades that you might not be able to complete normally. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, so we got four different types of resources. As you can see here, we got the reefers, we got heroines, we got purple pills. Um, so in fact, each of these correspond to what actually goes on to the actual card. And then from within the card, the resources are traded amongst each other to kind of show specifically how those trades are executed. Um, so you can see moving from place to place around the map as it corresponds to your card and then it corresponds to the individual resource chits that are moving within your board. Um, so I specifically wanted to go for kind of a, you know, very like classic kind of Milton Bradley 1970s style board game feel, um, but incorporated incorporating decades of research that I had done uh, kind of with CIA drug flow kind of charts. Um, there's tons of maps and information online that to me is very interesting as far as showing where these drugs are really produced and where they're really consumed at, um, and also how much drugs are confiscated versus how much they think ultimately goes through and how much is produced. Um, so to me, it all seemed very like a version of Risk that no one had quite made into a board game yet. Mm -hmm. um, there had been a few different games earlier that were kind of street-level dealers, where it was people, you know, there's like a famous like weed-based game that's a text-based game. Um, and there's a lot of games that specifically are the guy going from like a street nickel bag hustler trying to get his first brick and trying to be like a regional crime boss. And I think that's great. Those games are very exciting. Um, but this game specifically is kind of a top-down, like a general, um, like a big player within that whole kind of drug movement world. And that you're really putting together the different, you know, you got like a guy in the Great Lakes region 
you got a guy in Bolivia, you got a guy in Australia. And between those three different disparate locations, you're trying to use your network to move the drugs from what is produced to what is needed to ultimately score your points um, and be successful as a trader within that world while preventing other players all from doing the same thing and doing various, uh, you know, either um, regular old backstabbing or just kind of strategic outmaneuvering to kind of, you know, ensure that the game goes your way. Awesome. And, and again, this is not your first rodeo with a, with a, a board games or anything like this. Like we mentioned, you know, you, you, you had, you were a part in things like, like Morton's list and, and other games as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background leading up to this project. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah. So actually, so my very first board game, I want to say it was 90, say 98. Um, actually bizarre was a double album that was called bizarre, bizarre. One was spelled with two Z's, one was spelled with two A's. Um, in the bizarre release, there was actually a bugs on my nugs inset inside the liner notes on the actual compact disc. Um, and so that was my very first like true mass produced board game. As far as a game that was really, you know, there was a lot of these made, a lot of people got them and they even recently, Somebody had taken one, turned it from CD size, and then had a full like 12 by 24 inch playboard so that you could do like a full on Nug style. It was, it was very surprising. Um, and then from there, then I went into Quest for Shangri La, which is actually kind of a, a bit of an underground classic. It is very predominant with Insane Clown Posse yet again. Um, and then so I was actually the artist and a co developer uh, with my good buddy. Jump Steady and Nathan Andron, who kind of uh, had a long standing partnership with those two. We also worked together on Morton's List. Um, and within Quest for Shangri La, there was 64 distinct board game pieces and 300 some odd cards um, that I drew pretty much every single one of them. So it was a very big kind of art project and also some board game design as well. So to really take that board game, take the skeleton of it, and really make it into a fully complete, you know, highly rendered style uh, game with all the imagery of the various psychopathic artists. And that was definitely a, a very fun and very in, involved project. Mm -hmm. And again, taking taking that from there, I would say, and taking that kind uh -huh. of world that, that's being created around Insane Clown Posse as well, and translating that, right? Um, definitely, definitely. It was kind of a snapshot of when the game came out. It was kind of everything that was happening in psychopathic from you know, I mean, people that actually did actually worked in the warehouse, you know, mm -hmm. people that were like truck drivers, every kind of person on a tour or people in the studio or just, you know, everybody that was around at that time was included in some way, you know, either directly or indirectly in, in Quest for Shangri-La. And even through the main characters, um, you know, you'll see some of them are definitely very recognizable, you know, kind of icons with a psychopathic. Um, some of them are people who have since gone their separate ways. And some of them are the kind of these obscure people that, are even more in jokes than anything else, but that's kind of what makes it, you know, very hilarious that these are people that were, you know, like high level like road ninjas or uh stage like stage craft kind of people that were doing background things like that. And they all ended up in the game, like in some some way, shape, or form. So there's tons of in jokes, um, tons of people that were contributing sort of behind the scenes, and it really did a lot to expand the whole insane Juan Posse universe so in a very uh very unexpected way. That's awesome. Uh, and, then, and then from and then from there, um, actually, and then my kind of my personal favorite project, and a lot of them kind of uh, culminate and extend from Morton's List, um, which is a game we came out with in 2001, the original version that was myself, um, Nathan Andron, and uh, Rob Jump City. And working together, we did a lot of development um, until it finally came out. And it has been a very, very unusual game. Um, first, that we actually thought it would be kind of like D&D, &D, where we started to uh, approach people who are tabletop gamers, and we, they would um, But it turned out to be a little effects. We started to find the unique Morton's List people, and these are people that are kind of ready to do anything, um, but not necessarily sit at a tape-controlled time, which is, you know, again, there's that's board gaming. There's nothing wrong with that, but it is a little bit more predictable. You're going to be at a table with a pizza, you know, possibly your favorite beverage. All those things are kind of, there's a lot of knowns. Whereas Morton's List, it's entirely the unknown. Um, so you're doing things that may start at a table, but then take you out into the real world to do all types of unexpected things. Um, some of which might be outside of some people's comfort zones, especially if you're, you know, in the mood for like a board game as such. Um, so within that, it's been a very, very incredible and rewarding game playing experience and then even kind of meet people that really do connect with Morton's List that have these very transformative experiences. Um, and they really, the, the stories that people have are, 
are moving. They're really moved, even at the gathering of the jugglers. I was talking to people that were kind of, you know, veteran Warren's List players that have been playing it now for a very long time, um, some of which even right, right after it became public. And really to hear people describe, you know, kind of unexpected things that Morton's List has, you know, helped them do um, or has kind of given them a reason to do. Well, Morton's List is kind of a mirror, I think, in a lot of ways, or it's like a, kind of like an oracle that, you know, it, it, it only can answer what you're asking it, I think, is a big part of Morton's List. Um, but people that have had these experiences and really gotten a lot out of it, you know, to me, it's very, uh, very moving to be part of that and to you know hear the stories and to see that people continue to find new things within this very unexpected game um so that's been a lot of fun um and then even because of that because of morton's list um, there's actually a specific quest that is about inventing new games and so actually early in my kind of uh genesis of this drug lord game i was having a lot of conversations with what a board game could be like if it really brought a lot of kind of new ways of classic board games together, kind of having a simple mechanic, um, but using all new subject matter that I think hadn't really touched before. And so a quest um, was very formative in getting this from kind of the concept phase into actually making it a real board game. Um, similarly, my own writing has really evolved a lot with Morton's List. Um, there's a whole lot of kind of existential questions about technology um, and what it means for civilization, specifically the idea of if you can clone yourself and have sex with yourself, is it masturbation or just narcissism or what, or incest or kind of, you know, these, these kind of lines. And then similarly, you know, if you have a robot and the robot is programmed to resist your sexual advances, um, what does that say about the type of, you know, kind of erotic relationship? Because, of course, I think people that are definitely trying to invent robots, you know, it's, it's mostly for sexual purposes. I think if, if we've seen anything, it's the main thing people are trying to do with robots at this time. Um, and so it's really kind of a novel that stemmed from those ideas, um, or kind of the ways that you can abuse cloning at the highest levels, abusing robots at the highest levels, and also kind of a YouTube fame-based economy in which what you're watching or who you're paying attention to is a big part of what determines whose livelihoods are. Um, and kind of within that, thinking of these super luxurious, super celebrities that would be using this technology to live uh, extremely glamorous, highly watched lifestyles, but also at a very unusual price because of the technologies uh, and the way that they're marketed, of course. So a lot of that stemmed from, from Morton's List, um, my kind of earlier adventures in writing. Um, it definitely made me a lot more aware of a story that I wanted to tell, um, specifically using the language of fashion, the language of eroticism, and the language of technology um, to kind of combine and to sort of answer questions that I felt hadn't really been addressed um, sufficiently, especially kind of in films since Strange Days, The Matrix, and Total Recall, which I think are kind of a very formative uh, spiritual prequels uh, to this writing, where I'm trying to take those technologies of those films introduced and explore them in very interesting and then excel them even further into the future and based on what we know about, you know, corporate greed and ineptness, um, the pettiness of humanity and the real potential of AI. I think now that we have a clear idea of those things, um, we really wanted to write a sequel that had those elements within it. That's awesome. And of course, all this leads into Drug Lord now on Kickstarter. You say this is yes. your first your first Kickstarter um, um, deal like this. Um, what are the challenges you're finding? You know, of course, you know we're, we're midstream, of course, so we'll see how everything pans out with it, which of course is going to be with a resounding success. Uh, <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it, to me, it was really fun because, like I said, this board game is kind of a personal project. Yeah. Where it stemmed from some you know specific uh, things I was doing within gaming kind of anyways um and then once it really took root and started to turn into a complete thing i think that's when i realized that i did want to get it available to more people mm -hmm. um especially if it found the people that i hoped that it would resonate with um so the great thing with kickstarters of course you're actually you're basically pre-selling copies um so it's basically you know i've been going around at different events and most recently gathering the juggalos with my prototype and my demonstration and kind of, you know, letting people see it, letting people touch it, letting people ask questions. Um, and it really, it's been resoundingly just, people are just overwhelmed. They're just, they're, they're like, yeah, this is exactly the game that would be perfect for my group. Um, where it's not too complex, it's similar to games that they already know. 
but also in kind of a new format and of course about a very uh, topical subject matter, which is affecting uh, everything in all types of ways worldwide um, and all types of geopolitical senses as well. Um, so yeah, to kind of bring all that together into a specific kind of OG style board game. Um, also another upside of Kickstarter is actually the pre-sales are exciting and we can actually do this as all domestic manufacturing, in nice. fact. So these are actually uh, boxes that are made in the U.S. by actual Americans. The board and cards are actually all printed and all shipped uh, and actually right from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and so to me, I think that's very exciting that these are kind of unusual things that are part of Kickstarter that you couldn't do with, you know, just getting a couple thousand copies made from China, getting them bulk shipped or whatever. Um, similarly, there is actually an option you'll see if you go to the Kickstarter page, there is a customization option. So if you want, say, a region in the board game, um, like, for example, if you hang out in New Orleans, or here it says label as a self, and if you want it as your own actual space, you can get a customized board game, let's say Josh's Room, um, where then you can have a corresponding Josh's Room card that would then have actual specific quantities of drugs that are maybe tailored to what Josh uh, either does or thinks he does as far as consuming and production and how that then fits, fits into the global production scale. Um, similarly, there is an ultra deluxe metal case version. So instead of just having a high quality American printed cardboard box, you can actually get a extremely deluxe all metal aluminum style case, which then comes with everything inside of it. But instead of a box, it has an actual metal case. So it really looks like you're ready for some illicit style drug trading transaction action. <laughs> and that, that that that's a great that's a great thing to show up to uh, with your to your uh, board game night with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it really it sets a tone. It sets a tone. Definitely, you're coming in. It's really it's you're a lot more serious than maybe your regular games. Um, awesome. And see, so, yeah, I think that's that's kind of the uniquely fun thing that you can do Kickstarter. Um, yeah, we're a couple weeks out, so. Um, Right now, it's I've actually it's it's been crazy because the the gathering came up on me, on me really fast. I had some great playtesting right before that, and I realized mm -hmm. that I had to launch it at the gathering. There was just no way that I couldn't, based on you know, my previous work and everything. Um, so then I was scrambling to get the Kickstarter up, scrambling to get the video, which will be up very shortly as well. There will be links to that. Um, we're definitely on the Instagram and have been posting there um, pretty regularly, and that continues to grow. So all this is extremely brand new. And I think that's also what's kind of exciting as well, whereas like normally, you know, in the traditional model where you kind of you have the game, you have the pre-release, you do all the conventions, you do whatever. And I, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, I've been in that world. And I've been doing that with them. The idea of having a game that you can really directly get right to people. It's just you, mm -hmm. the internet, and the game designer. And to me, I think that's really exciting because then you can kind of see, you know, games that maybe aren't in every possible location that don't have mass distribution and are games that are kind of on the forefront of the type of games that are possible or that are made, you know, with these kind of uh, independent kind of ideas where you don't really have to get a lot of approval from various uh, corporate interests as far as, you know, what they think maybe your game should or should not include. And you can have a lot more of a, a true and direct vision, um, which I think has been a lot of fun in the games that we've done, um, specifically Morton's List, um, Quest for Shangri-La, and it's kind of, you know, very very independent approach to you know making making the games that we want to make um, so that people can enjoy playing a truer version of what we find entertaining we have a few uh questions and comments from the chat room i wanted to try to bring up here first of all our, our friend josh the literate juggalo out there uh now what if i wanted to oh, hell yeah josh <laughs> hell, hell yeah josh what's up who, who I believe has the uh, uh, metal case version and uh, huh, Josh's room, huh? Uh, <laughs> also, uh, now, what if you wanted to trade and sell strictly non-GMO GMO gluten-free foods instead of drugs? Is that maybe the next iteration? Um, <laughs> that That is possible. It's interesting you mentioned that, actually. Um, there is some discussion of actually a weed-based version of the game where it'd be mm -hmm. kind of similar, but dealing more with the domestic and international uh, weed transactions, um, specifically on the North American hemisphere, as far as that uh, type of trade, the mechanics of legalization and how that affects kind of the flow. I think it's very interesting. Um, but no, but to me, it was important to do actual real drugs as they're produced on earth today. Um, there's been some games that kind of deal with it a little bit. I feel they kind of nerf it a little bit where they're like, we have these blocks of dope and the dope is produced here and here and it kind of moves it there. And I mean, that's that's fine. You can go with that level of abstraction. 
But to me, I really wanted, you know, specifically, this is actually where the heroin is produced. This is where that, you know, this is where the actual cocaine growing areas are um, to really get a sense of how much of the world's volume of poppies do actually originate in Afghanistan. And then what that kind of makes for the global flow if you're trying to simulate a board game around that. Mm -hmm. um, but easily, there could be a much more PG version of this type of game with really any type of resources and kind of how they flow. Um, and I mean, but that's why there's there's other board games that do that already. I mean, obviously, you can play a board game where you're, uh, you know, you're doing railroads um, in either the today, the future, or the 1860s. Um, you can do electricity if you're trying to get an entire nation, you know, kind of wired with all the electricity. I mean, all these types of themes are all very, very explored and very well in some mm -hmm. of my favorite games. Um, but specifically to write, to have a semi-realistic abstraction of bulk level um, to challenge, which I realized that's what this game was really about. And that's what I, the game that I wanted to ultimately make. Absolutely. Also, I want to say what's up to Max out there, Steph, uh, Brandon in the chat room. Uh, if you they've been commenting here uh, a lot. Uh, there was a uh, Josh also said uh, I think I think for Quest Shang uh, Shang a two hour playtime quest is a lie. Although Max says if you drink it can be <laughs> if you drink it can be a six hour game. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> Quest for Shang La is it is it's kind of an endurance style game. Mm -hmm. um, in that there's no real end state. I mean, yeah, kind of like if you're playing with vet veteran Monopoly players or veteran Risk <laughs> players, you have a similar similar issue, right? Where you get the two superpowers. Yeah. yeah. And they just go on forever. Yeah. Um, and then so specifically even yeah, within Drug Lord, I wanted to make a, kind of a mechanic that specifically allows for a fixed end state. Um, so you really do have this racetrack mechanism at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so kind of as you're scoring and going along the various points, um, then you're actually fixed and the end is always in sight. And then the first player to trip this 20 points trips the final turn. And then everybody completes all their trade and then rounds up yeah. that turn until it kind of loops back around the beginning. That's nice. So this game, you know, right, it does it does have an actual end state. Of course, you can play it a lot longer if you want. Um, there's really nothing preventing you from doing a truly open-ended game where you're really trying to have total global dominance, but it's not exactly built for that. But I'd be curious to see what happens if people played it that way, which I'm sure they could. Uh, this is another question from Josh. He's asking, is it luck or strategy uh, that's most impactful for winning this game? Um, to me, I really wanted a blend of both mm -hmm. um, because I definitely, I do like the luck side of it. I always like chaos. I think mean, it's very interesting in games. Um, but then within that, there's definitely a lot of strategy that you can see because if you can see what regions you're in, um, the types of resources that you do, a lot of it does become very mathematical. So if you can kind of see these things beforehand, you can get a better sense of what trades maybe make the most sense and what regions to be looking out for as the empires continue to expand. Um, but within that, if you are a terrible, terrible dice roller, like some people are, then you can definitely lose even with a really good draw and really sound decisions. Um, so that's also kind of inherent to the game, which I guess is you know true of most games. Um, but even within that, there's a mechanism by which you can sway your die rolls um, so you can store resources and then use them kind of as pluses or minuses in the future. Um, so that way that also becomes a little bit more strategic if you have a very important die roll, then you can use that to modify it at that time. Um, I, we were running a little low on time, but I wanted to touch on mm -hmm. this because this is, uh, and again, I, you know, I've kind of, uh, personally stepped away from the juggalo culture for, for a few years, admittedly, <laughs> um, uh -huh, started a uh -huh. business and did stop listening to music basically. Uh, but, uh, I, I, w I've been amazed. And of course, you know, see, I was there when Norton's list came out and, uh, it's, you know, to, to now see things like the DCG con and seeing this or, or seeing the events that do happen at the gathering of the juggalos, it's really cool to see this general kind of gaming culture, within that sub community of the juggalos right uh, uh well, it, yeah yeah it, it goes it goes back to the beginning mm -hmm. i mean you know, like yeah like true story a big part of so if you go all the way back so right so you know joey a, a, aka two dope mm -hmm. um and the original manager on this guy alex abbas who has talked about quite extensively in the various books is kind of a, a mythical legendary figure um but they were actually in this core Dungeons and Dragons group um, that I kind of fell into because I was looking for people to get to role play with in the ninth grade. And then so I fell in with Joey and then Joey already knew this guy, Alex. And this is kind of, you know, before rapping, before 
anything really um just as there's kind of this common hub and it, there's you know there's lyrical references uh, throughout the, the clown's music oh definitely yeah, so this whole idea of, of gaming is is deeply intertwined i mean yeah rob was always a huge battle tech player um so he got a lot of strategic <laughs> gaming that way um and then even kind of simultaneously as you know these games are kind of grow or as the music is growing and kind of turning to this thing there's always been this kind of this within that kind of a kernel of real life gaming that was kind of everybody's uh, backdrop activity i mean yeah like thinking about it, i want to say if you go back to like 2003 2002 or four uh, oh, yeah, so even like netmaster gordon and then even jelly nuts and kind of the early internet ninjas a lot of those were also advanced board gamers. Um, mm-hmm. So Netmaster Gordon, for example, he ran a D20 Star Wars campaign. Um, kind of this is all, you know, prequel era, prequel era when the prequels are hidden. Um, and so kind of, you know, dealing in that kind of world, we did a lot of Deadlands. And so, yeah, so, so there's always been this this strong, you know, kind of theme of gaming. And then I think within that, it's been only natural to then start branching out and making our own games and kind of being independently creative to make, you know, make new things or kind of have that, Mm-hmm. Uh, exchange with this big thing that's been so important to all of our lives and imaginations. It's awesome to see that grow, and I, and I know that's that that undercurrent has always been there. But to see something like like the you know I've shown video uh, while we we're talking at the DCG Con in in Denver and how big of a thing that has become, uh, it's really oh, yeah. cool oh, yeah. to see that that building as well. So well, it, uh, it it got it got big enough to officially get shut down by the police. I mean, that's oh yeah, 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 board, just like not, the gathering. Not, not it's amazing, you know. <laughs> not not many board, not many like gaming conventions are actually having full on you know police intervention. <laughs> Although we definitely hope to we hope to never. Uh, replicate that specifically. No, and, you know, keep no, it, no. Keep it a little bit calmer, especially with the more family-based jugglers and uh, and just you know gaming enthusiasts. Where that's really we're kind of offering like the counter Gen Con. That if Gen Con has gotten too big and commercialistic for you, we offer extremely non-commercialized gaming. Um, yeah. An extremely lax, lax setting with people are all some of the best people on earth. So that's, that's you know, there's the it, it all comes together because I know the coming back, you know, everybody's like, oh, there's a lot of wrestling stuff happening there. Again, you know, some of my friends were actually on the card for JCW at the gathering, and it's just like, guys, no, these are like, yeah, that's big into it. Like we're all jugglers, but like we're gaming geeks, we're wrestling geeks, we're you know, this all comes together into that culture, and uh, you know, any chance I get to kind of help um um people see that i think is awesome hey thank you so much thank you for joining us and uh, of course we've we've muddled through the tech issues that, that come with getting the internet from an underground <laughs> and disclosed bunker ryzen has so, terrible coverage uh in the bunkers it's not under the plan but thank you so <laughs> much for joining us here uh on the show this oh, it's week been a, it's been a pleasure it's been a pleasure it's uh, great i don't usually get to do kind of a, a retrospective a retrospective of my various uh kind of creations um, but yeah, this is kind of straight from the underground laboratory and kind of where, uh, what sort of things that we create if left to our own devices. So yeah, so we have board games, we have real life games, we have collector's games, we have science fiction. I mean, there's all these kind of things that just percolate up if you're kind of uh, attuned to the frequencies that compel you to create. So it's uh, mm-hmm. it's my pleasure. And I always love talking about this stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you. We've had a, a hell of a showing here in the chat room as well. Uh, uh, Steph, because I know Steph came a little late in the video. This was play tested a lot with this game as well. I we're talking about how he he, he did that a bit uh, going into the gathering to make sure that got done. Uh, so it's definitely uh, uh-huh. taken uh-huh. care of there. So um, awesome. So thank you so much, uh, uh, our Jesse Dino, also known as Tall Jess to you Juggalos out there. Uh, check it out, and I, I recommend this for uh, uh, game fans of all kinds. Uh, this looks like a fun again. Got to see it in person. Uh, the game build and everything for the prototype. Uh, some quality stuff, and I think you won't be disappointed if you uh, do uh, pitch into this Kickstarter. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and where can people tell you? Uh, find you online real quick um yeah really the best way to go is instagram um so we do a lot of social media keep it very very uh, light and low footprint if you go to instagram uh at drug lord game um also hashtag drug lord game will show us up uh show you up very easily um on kickstarter if you search drug lord game or drug lord lord of drugs um, so it's kind of it's a you know a bit of a, a recursive title of course, um, and also druglordgame.us. Um, but that actually will probably point mostly back to the social media, and which also points back to the Kickstarter. Um, similarly, there is an at Jynabare, J Y N A B A R E, which features original art from the novel. Um, so kind of there's these erotic vector 
character-based illustrations that are kind of an in-world setting of both for products and experiences as offered by Johnny Bear, and also Mortonslist.com um, and Facebook slash Morton's List Game, um, where you can find information about random reality, uh, the unexpected, and kind of the uh, unusually spiritual awakening that some people experience through Morton's List. So all that is on the internet for your browsing pleasure. Ooh, look at that. A lot of that. And also, a lot of that is available on Amazon as well. So indeed, go indeed. get it. Go get it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I just saw the price of the paperback of Morton's List. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah, really. The, oh, the best man. Way to get, yeah, the, the best way to get Morton's List. Yeah, Morton's List is, is a mythical item. Is the oh, it's, thing. Uh, it's, uh, um, I'm looking at a $674 <laughs> price tag for a paperback. Not, that, that's, that sounds about right. The um, the best way to get it is to actually come find us. And if you find us at like DCGCon, for example, mm -hmm. that's one of the best ways to actually get Morton's List. If you're trying to buy it from resellers online, there's been a substantial markup. Um, so it really is yes. a kind of a little bit of a mythical item that's <laughs> out there. Um, but it doesn't exist. And kind of we feel that the power invested in those limited number of books um, does create much more magic for that's those, great those experiences that's happen, awesome thank so. you so much thank you everybody for joining us if you want to check out more interviews if you have anybody uh that you would like us to talk to uh in the board game in the juggler world in the, anything awesome in technology social media counterculture whatever the case may be let us know at awesome cast on the twitter we have a great uh, awesome cast facebook group where we talk about a lot of cool stories throughout the week that you guys can join as well and have a lot of great discussions i've been uh plug in this uh this project uh with my board game friends in there for a few weeks now uh ever since the gathering uh thank you so much please uh until next time please support uh independent board games uh thank you to my awesome guests you've been our awesome audience have an awesome week this show is a member of the sorgatron media podcast network Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.